And now let's welcome Joan Trumpower Mulholland, whose work with the Freedom Riders was forged by her childhood memories, spending summers in the Deep South. Well, as a child growing up in the South, I never gave segregation a thought until when I was about 10 and down visiting grandma in Oconee, Georgia, an old company logging town, not that fancy resort. My playmate sort of dared me to go with her and walk through the colored section. Now, that's not the word we used, but colored was a polite term back then. Black was rude, and, but you know what we used. Well, it was a little strange, but when we got to the colored school, that did it for me. It was a shack, never been painted. Front door was ajar. You could see the um, pot-bellied stove for heat, no electricity, no running water, no glass or screens in the windows, just wooden shutters, no playground equipment, no grass in the schoolyard, and only one outhouse. And I knew out the other end of town was the fanciest building for miles around, a brand new post-World War II brick school for the white kids. And I knew this was not fair. This was not treating other people the way we wanted to be treated, like we learned in Sunday school. And I sort of resolved that when I could do something to make the South the best it could be for everybody there, I would seize the moment. Well, that moment came when I was a freshman at Duke University in 1960, and the freedom and the um, sit-in started. And some of the students who were doing the demonstrations over at North Carolina College came over to a sort of semi-secret meeting um, at Duke and explained to us in legal and moral terms about the demonstrations. And then lo and behold, they invited us to join them. So a handful of us did join them on the picket line and then at the lunch counters and then in the jail. I was arrested twice at the lunch counters. Well, Duke was not happy and um, I finished my semester, got my credit hours and split for Washington, DC. Now the North Carolina college students said, asked me to go up to Howard University and find out what was happening. They hadn't heard anything. You know, this was back before interstate. I mean, it's getting late. My tongue is twisting around. This was back before email. And um, so I went up to Howard and a group of students were planning to sit in in a few days in Arlington. Well, since I was from Arlington, you know, across the river from DC, um, and I had a little experience in sit-ins and such, they asked me to join them. So I became part of the Howard group. And we caused what um, John Lewis would call good trouble that summer all over the DC area. Well, 61 was the year of the Freedom Rides. Now a little bit of a backstory on that. Mama Boynton had been working on voting education and trying to register for years down in Selma. And her son, Bruce, was a law student at Howard University. He had bought a bus ticket to go home and visit Mama. Got off in Richmond, Virginia, to um, went in to the station to get a bite to eat. He went in the wrong waiting room got himself arrested, and that case made it to the U.S. Supreme Court. The decision came down in December of 1960 that all facilities in the interstate travel realm had to be open to everybody equally. So the Freedom Rides got going um, by core to um, test compliance with the Supreme Court ruling. Well, things went, you know, not too bad. 
most of the way until they got to Alabama. That's where one of the buses, there were two bus lines in Greyhound and Trailways. One bus was firebombed just outside of Anniston, Alabama. And there's that picture of Hank Thomas standing outside the bus. Hank was part of our DC sit-in group. And the other bus, the Freedom Riders, were attacked when they got off the bus. So the beaten so badly, things could not continue. So following the teachings of Gandhi, if one person cannot continue, somebody else has to step up to take their place. So the students who had been sitting in across the South came and kept the Freedom Rides going. I was, the, it became fill the jails to force the Kennedys to in, uh, follow the Supreme Court ruling. Well, I was with a group that flew from Washington, D.C. down to New Orleans, and Stokely Carmichael was part of that group. So since I'd recruited him, I claim credit for taking Stokely to the Deep South and all that followed. My man. Well, we took the train, the Illinois Central from New Orleans and got off in Jackson, went into the waiting room, sat down and promptly got arrested, put in the paddy wagon and taken to the city jail. Now, when I went to step down out of the paddy wagon, the police officer reached out to take my arm to help me down. And that gave me faith that in the end, things were going to work out okay. So it was on to the city jail, to our trial, which was just pro forma, then over to the county jail. Of course, the jails were segregated. And here I was in this cell with all these white Yankee girls who had come south because they did not approve of or like white Southerners. And I'm the only white Southerner in that cell. They couldn't sing. They sounded like they were singing union songs, not church songs. And they didn't know what grits and collard greens were. Hmm. Well, it got so crowded in that cell that we had less than three square feet of floor space per prisoner. And one girl slept curled up in the shower. They had to do something. They decided to take us up to Parchman State Prison Farm, the most dreaded prison in the entire United States. They took the prisoners on death row and put them someplace nicer in the prison and put the Freedom Riders on death row. Well, they were trying to frighten us and I was on to them because I'm a Southerner. I knew what they were up to. And in reality, it was roomier and cleaner and the food was way better than in that old county jail. Now, when some of the guys got out of jail, they stayed in Mississippi. Some of these guys who had been sitting in then became freedom riders. They stayed to work in the communities and try to help people figure out what they could do to improve things. And they figured pretty fast that you got to be able to elect the people who make and enforce the laws. So voter registration became the big emphasis. And some of them, including my buddy Stokely, they moved on over into Alabama in a year or so around Selma. And that led to the march on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And we know how that went. Well, Mama Boynton was beaten severely and unconscious. Later, Congressman John Lewis, I think he had his skull cracked, but he definitely had a concussion. And it was so awful that President Lyndon Johnson, a Southern Democrat, went on national TV back when that was big, before a joint session of Congress and talked about the beating of Mama Boynton and said, we must have a voting rights law and we shall overcome. Those three words, we shall overcome, was the death knell of the Southern Democratic Party that had propelled him to the presidency. And he knew it when he said it. Okay, we got the Voting Rights Act. We got the federal registrars, the first elected black governor in the history in the 
entire history of the United States, Doug Wilder, who served in Richmond, Virginia, the capital of the Confederacy. And we got President Obama. Well, on the 50th anniversary of the March on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, there's Mama Boynton sitting in a wheelchair, almost 100 years old. And on either sides of her are President Obama and Congressman John Lewis. We had come that far. Well, now, I didn't go out and work in the field because a white girl working in the field back then, that was forbidden because we would endanger everybody else just by our presence. I had already been accepted at Tougaloo College, so I went on out to campus a little bit before, you know, our former speaker. And I had to study hard. I did indeed. And in 63, that was the most important year. And you ask most people, what do you remember about 1963 and the Civil Rights Movement? Oh, it's the March on Washington, a wonderful day. Well, that's just a small part of the story. They had been the dogs and the fire hoses on the kids in Birmingham. Less than a month later, we had our Jackson Woolworth sit in where I had all this sugar dumped on my head like I wasn't sweet enough. That was the most violent reaction to a sit-in. It's the most used sit-in picture in the country. And it was the most integrated sit-in. Ann Moody, who's black, me's white. And in that picture, you got Professor John Salter, who's Native American. That was something to do. But then we got out of there alive, though it had been a little iffy. Emotionally, I had just shut down. It was like an out-of-body experience. And I hear that that happens to soldiers in combat. But we did make it out. And um, then just a couple weeks later, Megger Evers was shot to death in his driveway with an armload of t-shirts that said, Jim Crow must go. Then we got to the March on Washington. That was good. I had spent most of the summer working in the DC's March on Washington office and spent that day working in the press tent up on the monument grounds. Wonderful. But then about two weeks later, the 16th Street Baptist Church was bombed in Birmingham and those four little girls were killed. A bunch of us went over from Tougaloo College for the funeral of three of them. And we stopped at the church and picked up a bunch of shards of glass of the stained glass that had come out of the windows. Most of mine is now on exhibit down at the Smithsonian's African American Museum. And to round out the year, President Kennedy was assassinated in November. Okay, bad year. 64, I graduated, moved back up to Washington, D.C. area, married, raised five sons. That was a challenge. But they, they made it. I made it through. In 2009, I went to Obama's inauguration with um, another person who had been involved in the um, Jackson sit-in. But first, we went to Medgar Evers' grave in Arlington National Cemetery, sort of to virtually report to him what had happened, to give thanks for him and the other people who had died getting us the right to vote. That was sad, but happy too that we now had the fruit of our labors with President Obama. We walked across the bridge, across the river as we say around here and took in the inauguration. 2015, just to update things, Australia had copied our freedom rights. They did it for Aboriginal rights, same discrimination over there pretty much. And they were having the 50th anniversary of the Australian freedom rights. That's where I got my shirt. That's not from the US freedom rights. That's from the Australian freedom rights. 
and I took my 15-year-old granddaughter with me. Her teachers figured she'd learn more going on this adventure to Australia than she would learn if she stayed in school. And I think she did. Well, I'm not marching anymore. My knees have worn out. But I travel all over the country to speak. Well, now I'm zooming around the country to speak. And I tell what we did back in the day because those who forget the past are condemned to repeat it. And I encourage folks to carry things forward. My generation took care of legal segregation, but we still have lots of discrimination out there. And folks need to keep moving forward and take care of the problems because black lives do matter and we shall overcome. Thank you.